Well, hello and welcome to the Las Vegas Sun interviews. I'm Rick Anderson, the editorial page editor for the Las Vegas Sun. Our guest today is Nevada State Treasurer Zach Conine, who in his two years in office has drawn attention for his work on several innovative measures to help Nevadans improve their own financial situations, while also helping state residents and the state government weather the coronavirus pandemic. Mr. Treasurer, good morning. Good morning. How are you? Doing well. And you, sir? Just fine. Well, let's jump right into the news from this week with you joining Governor Steve Sisolak in introducing a bill to fund what's known as the State Infrastructure Bank. Tell us what the State Infrastructure Bank is and what this bill would do. Well, let's start with what it would do. What it would do is help Nevada modernize its infrastructure and more importantly, put Nevadans back to work. We said it in the hearing and we're going to keep saying it. The Infrastructure Bank is about jobs, jobs, jobs. And functionally, what an infrastructure bank does is it allows us to leverage state capital, like the $75 million worth of bonding authority that my office created by having the highest credit rating in Nevada state history, or taking in outside capital from the federal government. President Biden's American Jobs Plan will bring a ton of infrastructure dollars to the state. It also lets us leverage capital from private uh, pension funds and other investors. And all of those things together, again, it's about jobs, jobs, jobs. We're going to be able to rebuild the Nevada that we deserve. Finally, roads, bridges, broadband, educational facilities, healthcare facilities, recycling, uh, clean energy. We're going to be able. We're going to be able to do all of it thanks to the State Infrastructure Bank. Now, why not just put this uh, funding into the regular State Capital Improvement Fund? What's the um, What's the benefit of having a, a separate State Infrastructure Bank? Focus and leverage. So in the state infrastructure bank, we're able to focus on economic development facing projects. We're able to look at projects in partnership with GoEd, other state agencies, municipalities, counties, cities. We're able to find the projects that make the most sense from an economic development standpoint and lean into those. Additionally, there are other dollars coming into the state, whether they're federal or private, that want to invest in infrastructure. Public Works isn't set up to do that work. They do a really great job managing state projects. This is a little bit different. Well, and where did this idea come from? So the State Infrastructure Bank was originally passed back in 2017. It was really focused on roads and bridges. And it was passed, as it was in a lot of states, uh, in advance of an infrastructure week that never came. And so when we got into office, one of the things that we like to do in the Treasury is we look for opportunities. We're investors. And so we looked around for different ways that we could get Nevadans to work, that we could build infrastructure, because we know we sorely need it here in Nevada. And we started working on the Infrastructure Bank. This was in 20. Uh, 19, mid 2019. Mm -hmm. And then the pandemic hit. And what was a good idea became an absolute necessity. And so working with the governor and the legislature, we were able to prioritize it. We were able to get it in the state of the state uh, that the governor delivered in January. And with any luck, we'll be able to pass it and get it spun up and putting people to work before the end of the year. Wow. And, and how will the projects um, under this uh, state of infrastructure bank be chosen? Um, you know, will it go through the regular process or is there a separate process for that? So there's a specific process to the state infrastructure bank. A board is outlined in the statute, includes myself, uh, members of the administration, a couple of appointees, and that board will put together bylaws and a rubric to evaluate projects. And this is really important. That rubric is going to be transparent and it's going to be quantifiable. So we're going to look for projects that put people back to work quickly. We're going to look for projects that create the most economic development outcome. And we're also going to look at the different streams of funding that are coming in. Because what I think sometimes people fail to realize is it's not just one pool of money. It's hundreds of pools of money. It's Opportunity Zones, EB-5 and EB-6 schema. It's a new market tax credits. And being able to layer all of that with internal capital, federal capital, and invested capital is quite a bit of work. But if we get it right, when we get it right, we're going to create jobs, jobs, jobs. So I have to ask this as a journalist, will there be open meetings? Will, uh, will, the, um, uh, will the, the, the decision makers be um, you know, operating with open records and so forth? Yes, of course. In fact, one of the things you'll see as a, as a trend uh, coming out of our office is transparency. Right? We think it's incredibly important. We think that more ideas and stakeholders and people at the table is a more effective process, especially now that we're coming out of the pandemic. You know, we're in the center of receiving almost $7 billion of funding from the federal government direct to states and municipalities. That comes in 94 different buckets. One more time, 94 different buckets. We got guidance on one of those buckets earlier this week. 
was 150 pages long. So the government is going to need to be transparent. We are going to need help from community stakeholders, from people who understand the work better than we do to make sure that everybody's at the table and that the bank and everything else we do is as efficient and effective as, for taxpayers as possible. If, if you had your wish list of the top five infrastructure projects that you'd like to see funded, um, what would be on those? I think there's a couple that make a lot of sense. We've got to figure out broadband. There's a ton of money coming into the state for broadband. We've got some great partners in the private sector that are looking to sort it out. You saw Senator Chris Brooks yesterday uh, reveal a relatively large transmission-focused energy package, and that's going to be really important, although they certainly aren't in need of capital. We're also going to look at ways that we can replace our crumbling education infrastructure, help fill some of the gaps that we found during the pandemic in our healthcare infrastructure, and any other project that can help be, bring uh, much needed resources and jobs back to the state of Nevada. All right. Well, let's shift over to another topic. Um, last month, the Sun's editorial board commended you for spearheading legislation to promote what are known as ABLE accounts, uh, which are tax-free savings accounts for individuals with disabilities. Um, what was the genesis of that legislation and why was that an important priority for you? So ABLE accounts stand for Achieving a Better Life Experience. It's a program put out by the federal government. And the goal of these accounts is to let individuals um, who are disabled, uh, either mentally, physically, whatever, um, who need additional help. And so they're likely on Medicaid. And if you're on Medicaid, there is a level of income and savings that you have to stay under. Otherwise, you lose those benefits. And that creates sort of an odd situation uh, where those individuals can't get ahead. They can't save for an apartment. They can't run a business. They're basically um, disincentivized uh, from living the best life they can. And so ABLE accounts give them a way around that. Now, when our office uh, started looking at ABLE accounts, we've always managed the funds. Uh, the actual administration of the marketing of the accounts was held somewhere else. We looked at it last session and realized we thought we could do a better job. When I got in office, there were about 90 ABLE accounts in the state of Nevada. Now there's more than 1,000, right? We've it increase that exponentially yeah. simply because we're working on it. And I think that's one of the things that this treasury has been able to do. And I'm blessed with such a great team. We're able to take things that government has always put in the too hard pile and move them into this needs to be done. And then we get them done. So this last bill is a first in the nation bill that will allow us to take in funds from banks, from individual donors, from businesses to allow for a match. Because often when individuals are trying to start an ABLE account, one of the barriers to entry is they can't get enough money in it to make sense. But this match will allow them to put money in, have that money matched by other donors. We think it's a first, we know it's a first in the nation program, and we're already getting calls from other states about how they can replicate it. Yeah, and um, the matching funds, I know that, that you're trying to build up a, uh, a fund of those. Um, how are you going about that? And what's your goal there? We're doing exactly what you'd think we'd do. We are calling people who care about Nevada, and we're asking them to step up. And like they usually do, Nevadans step up to help other people. Well, that's great. Um, let's, um, let's move on to another topic now. You and I ran into each other uh, early this year at the uh, opening of the Showboat Apartments. Mm -hmm. And um, we talked at that time about some of the um, uh, about some of the measures that you were working on uh, with the governor's office and, um, you know, on your own initiative um, to uh, expand affordable housing and to promote affordable housing. Walk us through some of those, if you would. Absolutely. So over the last two years, the state of Nevada has committed more resources to affordable housing than any two-year period in Nevada history. I'll say it again. We've done more in the last two years than any other two-year period in Nevada history. That's a commitment of more than $600 million dollars of what are called private activity bonds, conduit issuances, which flow through uh, business and industry and then come to the Board of Finance, which I sit on along with the governor uh, and the controller and a few other folks. And our commitment there has always been about keeping affordable housing affordable and building more affordable housing. You know, that represents thousands of units of affordable housing, but we know that's not all the work that needs to be done. So one of the things we're working on, and I've had a, a chance as treasurer to become involved in some national groups who are doing this sort of work. And one of them is the State Debt Management Network, uh, which now I chair. That's all municipal issuers throughout the country. And one of the things we're working on is figuring out how the state can get more private activity bond cap, which will allow us to support more affordable housing projects. And I think another piece about keeping housing affordable 
making sure people can stay in their homes. And I know we're going to talk about the pandemic later, but one of the first calls we made uh, after the governor had to shut the strip down was we started calling banks and mortgage servicers to make sure that Nevadans were protected against foreclosure. We got those protections in Nevada before the rest of the country. Eventually, it moved out so that everybody was protected against foreclosure. But we had it here first. And that's because of the strength of relationships we've been able to develop with our treasury between our banking and uh, mortgage servicing partners. We're deeply grateful for their work to keep Nevada safe. Why was this a priority for you going into office? And what were you seeing that, that made it a priority for you, I guess? Housing st uh, stability is economic stability, right? And so as the state's chief investment officer, we're always looking at ways that we can make sure that our, ec or that our economy, that our economic recovery is as strong and as stable as possible. We know if people have difficulty finding a home, it makes it easier, uh, it makes it more difficult, excuse me, for businesses to move here. It makes it more difficult for people to move up. It makes it more difficult um, from a social safety net standpoint, right? Because if there aren't enough homes and eventually some of those people end up homeless and when individuals are homeless, it's simply more expensive for the government. We need to solve the problem, not deal with the symptoms. And that's been important for the treasury forever. It became more important over the last uh, two years. And I think we've done some really good work, but we know there's a lot more work to be done. When you look at the housing market too, uh, in, in especially in Southern Nevada, and I guess in Northern Nevada too, um, I mean, is that putting more urgency on this issue? I think the urgency exists. I don't think the, the increase in prices in the housing market, which to us appears to be a lot more stable uh, than what we looked at going into the Great Recession, right? A lot more owner occupied, uh, a lot more equity as a, as a percentage of the home's total worth as opposed to debt. Um, and so that gives us some level of comfort on the is it or isn't it a bubble question. But we need more housing. We need more affordable housing. We need to figure out solutions to meet, make sure that more Nevadans are able to find housing. And sometimes that means we need to figure out uh, all the resources we could possibly throw at a situation. Uh, and luckily the federal government uh, has shown up and has a lot of resources. And one of the things we're, we're looking through and working with stakeholders on is how do we use some of that federal support to fix what has become a systemic housing shortage. Well, let's um, shift back to the legislature again. What's on your legislative um, wish list this year or your to-do list this year? Uh, and have you ticked everything off or are you still working on things? Oh, we'll be working right until midnight on the last day. But a lot of our legislative agenda this year has been in partnership with the governor's office. And he's had a lot of faith in me and I'm deeply grateful for it. We work very closely with him and his staff on trying to achieve uh, the things we think we need from a state perspective. So let's talk about a couple of those. Yeah. AB 445 is a bill by Assemblywoman Danielle Monroe Moreno, which seeks to get to the root of a historic problem here in Nevada, which is federal grants. We're about 47th in federal grants out of 50 states mm. uh, for what we receive per capita. If we just got to the average per capita level for Nevadans, if Nevadans by person moved up to the level uh, of the rest of the country, the average for the rest of the country, the state would get in more than 1.1 billion dollars in federal support a year. One more time, 1.1 billion dollars, right? It's about 25% of our budget, give or take, on an annualized basis, what we can actually control. And so we know that that work to fix that is not one thing. There is no silver bullet for federal grants, but we have a lot of other states to look at who do it better, 46 of them, in fact. And so Assemblywoman Monroe Moreno's bill will actually take the grants office from uh, where it currently sits nestled in a series of other departments and moves it to a cabinet level position. And then we're gonna do the work over the next two years to set that cabinet level position up for success by making sure that we finally get rid of some of these friction points along the way in federal grants. The governor laid out his target during the state of the state, $100 million over the next biennium, $500 million a year by 2026. We think that target is conservative and we're gonna blow it out of the water. That's one thing. Thing number two uh, is the Millennium Scholarship. We've got a bill called SB 128. Uh, our office manages, of course, the Millennium Scholarship, which has helped more than 140,000 of Nevada's best and brightest stay here and go to college here. We think it's an amazing program, um, but it has gotten very expensive. And so 128 allows us to look at, Senate Bill 128, sponsored by Senator Dennis, allows us to look at all the different scholarship programs that flow through our office. And NSHE, we, of course, as the Treasury, are the largest provider of scholarship programs outside of uh, the, the uh, Nevada system of higher education. So we're going to look at that. We're going to find the most effective way uh, for us to get there. We also have SB 47, which is an emergency financial measure, effectively a parachute for finance. One of the things we found out during uh, the pandemic, and frankly, no one had ever asked this question before, is the state can't borrow money 
uh, in an emergency without the legislature coming into session. We can't have a line of credit. We can't uh, issue some warrants to get through a short-term cash crunch, which makes us one of the few states in the country that can't do it. We're also one of only four states that has legislative sessions every other year. So SB 47 will give us a last ditch parachute. So if we need to generate money, if we need to borrow money in order to pay for operations in the short term, right, to make payroll or something like that, we'll be able to do it. That's a small thing that we hope we're never going to have to need, but that's what our job is. And that's what I think the, the point of being any elected official is, is to try to make the system better for people down the road that you're not going to meet. I wish somebody before me had created that tool. They hadn't. So now we're here. We're going to create it for the next folks. And I'll point out two more things. We talked about the infrastructure bank already, uh, but SB 71. So SB 71 is our unclaimed property bill. And for anybody who doesn't know, unclaimed property is the way that the state keeps control of dollars that are lost along the way. So if you have a safety deposit box and you forget about it, eventually that comes to us. If there's a check from maybe a payroll check that you never cashed or you never got, that comes to us. We hold it in trust in perpetuity. We've got more than $930 million of unclaimed property. Uh, in our trust account. And this year, over this past year, we've processed more claims working from home, right? During a pandemic, we've processed more claims than any year in treasury history. We think we've processed more claims per capita, although this is a tougher number to check, than any unclaimed property department in the history of the planet. We are killing it on unclaimed property. But one of the things we realized during the pandemic is that we can't return unclaimed property to individuals without them applying for it, even if we have perfect information. So at the beginning of the pandemic, of course, a lot of people uh, unfortunately had to file uh, for unemployment assistance. And we know that that process wasn't great, right? Isn't in our office, but we know it wasn't great. And so we were able to take that list of folks who had filed for unemployment insurance and tie it, connect it to our unclaimed property list to see what individuals who had filed for unemployment insurance had unclaimed property. We found more than $10 million of money owed to Nevadans were out of work. And so we started reaching out to them to give it back. But this bill will allow us to just do what we should have been able to do in the first place, which is send them a check. Well, that's good. I'd like to back up to um, the federal grant um, uh, measure. I, I'm fascinated to learn that the Nevada ranks so low there. And you mentioned friction points. Um, what are some of those friction points? Well, we're about to get pretty wonky, Rick, so I, I apologize for it. <laughs> That's but right. we've basically created over time and through the efforts of individuals just trying to make sure that we didn't do anything wrong. We've created a situation where it's very hard for something to go right, right? So if you're an agency and you apply for a federal grant and you get that federal grant, it gets pulled out of your budget. So you're in the exact same place you were. Federal grants require a ton of paperwork. The state also requires a ton of paperwork. It's not the same paperwork. And so you've created all of these different points along the way that make it more difficult for people uh, to go get federal grants. And, and state employees, you know, aren't incented in the same way, right? They're incented because they deeply care about public service, um, but they're not, they don't get paid more if their uh, office brings in more money, right? And so we've created a series of barriers that make it hard. But the biggest thing on federal grants, the biggest friction point is that federal grants are a culture. You have to be thinking all the time about how we can get federal support for programs. Sometimes programs we're doing in, in Nevada, you know, one, two, and three in a programmatic uh, scenario, but if we did four, we'd open up a bunch of federal grants. But we need to be thinking about it. It needs to be part of the culture, and we need to do the work every day in order to make sure that federal grants are at top of mind. And that was what we told the governor, and the governor deeply agreed. And so we put us and Assemblywoman Monroe Moreno on a path to fix this, finally. We're going to do it. All right. Well, let's look back. Um, we, you mentioned earlier that we were going to talk about uh, the coronavirus pandemic and, and some of the things that the treasurer's office has done uh, in response to that. Uh, so that open question, what are, what are a couple of the things um, that people might be interested in knowing uh, about your office and um, what you have been doing in the last uh, 14 months uh, uh, as this thing has steamrolled us? Uh, I'm laughing a little bit because I'm wondering how much time you have. Um, so. <laughs> What we realized early on in the process is that there were a lot of experts on the health front and we had nothing to add there, right? We're investors, right? I have a hospitality background. We're not medical professionals. And so we let the medical professionals be the medical professionals and that's good for everybody. But what we did was we immediately started focusing on economic response and recovery because we knew that we had something to add there. 
And you know, a lot of these functionalities don't historically exist in the Office of the Treasury, but luckily I've got a great relationship with the governor and his team. We work exceptionally well with GoEd uh, and we generally are prepared. And so it's, it's created a situation where we've been able to help in a way that no other treasury has ever helped. Um, I've mentioned originally, we worked with banks and credit unions to stop foreclosures in Nevada before they became a problem. And not only that, we made hundreds of calls to banks, to credit unions on behalf of individual Nevadans. Sometimes the credit union had made a decision at a national level uh, that they weren't going to pursue foreclosure, uh, but they didn't make that, that decision didn't get down to the local level. And we found that sometimes, and uh, this will be a repeating theme, when the treasurer calls, the call gets picked up and folks figure out uh, what exactly was wrong. So we were able to keep some people in their homes uh, and that work has been very, very important to us. We launched and coordinated the state's rental assistance program. So the CHAP program, uh, which was originated in Clark County with their work, we took it, made it part of the state's program. There's now about $350 million in rental assistance uh, that'll be available through the coronavirus housing assistance program. And that's everywhere throughout the state. It's kept thousands of Nevadans in their homes. We administered the largest small business program in Nevada history, and it's not close. The Pandemic Emergency Technical Support Grant Program, or PETS program, uh, upon completion, will have about $102 million out to Nevada small businesses, almost 10,000 Nevada small businesses that have been kept alive through the works of our effort. And, and let's be clear, we didn't hire a single person to do this work. These are people in your treasury. This is myself, the office, uh, Governor's Office of Economic Development and their director, Michael Brown. We are making calls to businesses on nights, on weekends, on Thanksgiving, to try and find these businesses to confirm that they are real, to avoid fraud and to get money in their pockets. It's the best work this treasury has ever done. It has helped thousands of Nevada businesses, tens of thousands of folks. And we're able to design a program that's so good that the SBA copied a lot of the parts of it with their small uh, restaurant relief program. We were able to devise a program that got money out the door more quickly than any other state aid program. Although again, it's government work. It goes a little bit slower, I think, than we'd all like it to because of you know, just the mechanics of government. Uh, but we got that money out exceptionally quickly. Uh, luckily, it started as a $20 million program. Uh, we got $150 million worth of applications. We were able to get another 10 and then another 20 and then another 50 through the legislature. Uh, and we've been able to get it out. And again, we're calling these businesses, right? We're talking to these businesses making sure that they're actually in Nevada, making sure that they're actually using the money for the things that they want, making sure that they're not scammers. Because unfortunately, we've been dealing with a lot of financial uh, scamming opportunities uh, or attempts during um, this crisis. In addition, we've put out something with the governor's office and the legislature that I think will be a topic of conversation for the next couple of years. And that's the Every Nevadan Recovery Frame. The Every Nevada Recovery Framework speaks to how the state is going to go through the process of administering almost $7 billion of federal money. Because we know, you know, we know that this much money isn't going to come to the state again. And we know more than anything else, Nevada has a boom bust cycle, right? We saw it in 2008, we've seen it before, uh, we saw it in 2001. The, and what ends up happening is we get to now, we get to the point where the economy is starting to recover. We don't have to wear masks anymore if we've been vaccinated, which is amazing. We've kept people safe. Uh, we've lost many, many more people uh, than we could have, but we did the best that we could. And now we're at a point where things are getting better. Nevada historically and your government historically has taken that time and said, all right, that was tough. Let's go back to the good times. What they could do, the road that we're choosing, is to go and say, there are some systemic problems in Nevada that get exasperated, that become more visible during times of crisis, right? The things like a DEER system that we've never invested in, it's been more than a decade since we've invested in it, a DMV system, a healthcare system that is woefully under-resourced, schools that are old and can't provide social distancing because there are too many kids in each classroom. How do we go through the process of spending this federal money so that we actually fix those things? Not create short-term benefit, not ribbon cuttings uh, and glad handing, but long-term benefit. That is the work. It is harder. It is less exciting. It is deeply less sexy. 
Uh, but I can promise you, your treasury is not sexy. Your treasury is efficient. Well, um, how do we get to that point um, where we're fixing some of those systemic problems really without diversifying our economy a little bit more? And what can the treasurer's office do uh, in terms of getting us to that place? Uh, it's a great question. We work more closely with GoEd uh, than any treasury has since GoEd was created. And that's been a fantastic partnership. You know, when the governor asked us to step in and help take a role in economic recovery, I think he did so because of my background. You know, I, I grew up in hospitality. I used to work as the director of operations at the Golden Nugget. I opened uh, the, the downtown Grand, which used to be the Lady Luck. I've been involved in openings of more than 25 restaurants with thousands of employees. And we know that the solution to economic diversification is not the government showing up and saying, go there, diversify. The solution is working with private business to make sure that we've created the sort of Nevada that they want to invest in. But that goes back to that question, that kind of moment at the end of last year when we were trying to figure out what the economic recovery would look like. And we realized getting back to where we were is not acceptable. The Nevada that we've been living in is at the bottom of a lot of lists we want to be at the top of, at the top of a lot of lists we want to be uh, at the bottom of. It is not the Nevada that we deserve. It's not the Nevada that Nevadans deserve. And so we're going to work now to fix those systems. We're going to work now to diversify our economy. We've got thousands of Nevadans, tens of thousands of Nevadans whose jobs aren't going to come back. And that's not because of the pandemic. The pandemic just sped up a process that was happening already. We've got to get those folks employed. We've got to get those folks trained and retrained. We've got to make sure that our education system matches up with the jobs of tomorrow. And NG's doing a heck of a job, uh, but we've got to figure out how the state can help those efforts. And you ask where the Treasury's role is in all of this. We're the state's chief investment officer. All we think about is how we can spend money now create more opportunity in the future. All I thought about in the private sector, all I think about in the public sector. All of these efforts, keeping Nevadans in their homes leads to more economic stability in the future. Helping make sure that those small businesses, those almost 10,000 businesses can stay alive because of that $100 million program that we ground our way through is because then those businesses can hire folks and keep folks hired and that they can get back and our economy can be more stable. Small businesses are exceptionally important, but so are large businesses. And we know we need to fix Nevada in order to make sure that they can come here. Well, I want to, let's back up um, and, and talk about the treasurer's office um, kind of more in general. I think a lot of people don't understand what the treasurer's office does because a lot of people don't interact directly with the treasurer's office like you would with you know, the DMV or you know, a, a more of, of the front porch kind of departments of government. When, when you took office in 2019, um, what were some of your goals as far as changing the operations of the treasurer's office, uh, kind of putting your stamp on the treasurer's office? Yeah, it's a good question. And I think the, the first thing that uh, I realized in the treasury as soon as I got in there, just like any other business that I had moved into, you know, as a, as a consultant, right, a hospitality consultant, so we move into a business. One of the first things you do is you try to get a lay of the land. You talk to everybody, you understand the work, you look at the metrics and figure out where the business is being successful, where the business has opportunity. And what I came into was a treasury that is run by some of the most dedicated public servants in Nevada history. I have an amazing team. And so we were able to focus the work on how can we shift the focus of the office in certain ways, knowing that the day-to-day -day work of the office was done so, so very well. And, it's, and I, just to, to speak about that for a minute, we borrowed money in the last, uh, last time we borrowed money to pay for roads and bridges and schools and things we all like because the, the treasury is responsible for the issuance of debt. We borrowed money at the lowest interest rate on record. We have the highest credit rating ever in the history of Nevada. And the reason we have that credit rating is because we worked with the credit agencies to explain what Nevada was and how Nevada was progressing, how it was getting better. And we've had the investment returns and the financial stability, even through the pandemic. And this is important. We did not get a credit downgrade during the pandemic because of the hard work that was done, because of the work the legislature did to make the cuts they needed to do. That has allowed us to borrow money extremely cheaply. Our investment returns on a dollar for dollar basis are the highest of any treasury in history. We are killing it at traditional treasury functions. And so the, the work of a good manager is to help out with those efforts but not to screw them up because I want to touch everything, 
right? And I think that's an, it's an important quality of a leader and it's an important thing for folks in public office to remember uh, there are people who have been there before you. There will be people who are there after you. You are a caretaker of the office. I am the treasurer now. They are the treasury always. The second thing we looked at is how can we make sure that the office, uh, to your point, did interact with more people and helped more folks. And college savings is one of the best examples of that. So the college savings office historically has sold products. So college savings, uh, which is all paid for, and I think this is, I guess, important. The Treasury is one of the few offices in the state of Nevada that doesn't make, doesn't take money from the general fund. We make money from the general fund in investments. We are a net contributor to the budget, uh, which of course we're all very proud about. But the College Savings Office, which manages the Millennium Scholarship College Kickstart, which is the program largest of its type in the world, that's given fifty dollars to every public school kindergartner uh, to help them kickstart their college education. We have our 529 plans, which are basically like 401ks uh, for college. We have $26 billion in 529 assets. We have people from other states who invest in our 529 plans because of how good they are, right? But what we realized was those are all products. And a lot of Nevadans do not have the financial resources in order to invest in something like Nevada prepaid tuition, one of 10 programs in the country that allows you to pay today's rates for college in the future. It's an incredibly solvent program. It's an incredibly great program. I've got three kids and I've got three prepaid tuition contracts, but not everybody has the resources to do that. And so we brought on new staff. We made sure that we could meet people where they were. When I got there, the office had one individual who speaks Spanish. Now it's about 50% of the office. And we are able to go to where folks are and not just tell them about the products we have to sell them, but tell them about the other things that the state can do to help them prepare. I mentioned federal dollars earlier on. FAFSA, which is the, uh, the form that students have to fill out in order to get things like Pell Grants, right? It opens up a lot of federal aid. Nevada is only middle of the road on FAFSA completion. We're 28th, 27th. We can make that number better, and it's all about awareness. We created a student loan ombudsperson during the last legislative session, a bill um, that was championed by Speaker Frierson and Assemblyman Howard Watts. And that student loan ombudsperson, all they do is work with Nevadans to try and make sure that their student loan situation, either going into a student loan or coming out and paying it back, is more effective. She's helped teachers who have been doing public service, who were denied the public service uh, waiver of, um, uh, of their student loans, because there's a, a process, right, where if you, you get loan forgiveness, if you work in a public service field for 10 years, and they, a lot of people got denied, more than 98% of people who applied to the program under the last administration got denied. Right. We helped that teacher get rid of more than $100,000 of student loan debt, which she had worked to get rid of, but that the government on the federal level wasn't doing what it was supposed to. And so we, we shifted our focus in college savings away from products and into people. And we created something called navigate.gov and that's N-V-I-G-A-T-E.gov, you'll forgive the commercial. But what that is, is your one-stop shop to plan for, save for, and pay for college. Not just if you've got a ton of money, not just if you can dedicate putting hundreds of dollars a month into a college savings program, but if you can't put any money into a college savings program. We created a scholarship database with the help of Assemblyman, Assemblywoman Tolls, excuse me, first of its type that brings in both NC and private scholarships, federal scholarships in the one place so that Nevadans can help figure it out. And finally, we created something called the College Savings Navigator, an idea we stole from President Obama and the Navigators came with the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. We know that applying for college, paying for college is difficult. It's a thing that students only do once. A lot of times, especially in Nevada, we've got first generation college students. They don't necessarily have anyone to turn to or help on. What am I supposed to do? How does this work? And so we've created this navigator position that works one-on-one -on -one with students every day, making sure that they're better prepared for the future. And finally, the College Savings Department knows that it's important to tell the stories of individuals who have been successful because if people can see it, they can be it. And so we've done, gosh, more than 50 events during the pandemic with people of color, with, uh, with women, with veterans, with small business owners, Asian American members of our community, with people who are graduating from high school. We did one event with kindergartners uh, and first graders um, that was fascinating. I don't know if you've ever interviewed a kindergartner, but I encourage you to do so. Uh, you learn a lot. Uh, but we've done all these events because we want to meet Nevadans where they are, right? We want the College Savings Office 
to be as effective as it can be. And, and I'll also say our unclaimed property department, uh, which is probably our most front porch piece yeah. of government, uh, return more property to more people uh, since we got in office than ever before. They are, and I said it before, I'll say it again, they're killing it, getting property out the door. They're recovering more money from businesses who have a legal obligation to turn it over to the state. We're getting it back out. Uh, we've returned, again, more than $2 million to Nevadans who are on unemployment insurance who didn't know they had the money until we reached out. And once this bill passes, we'll be able to give the rest back. All right. Well, I think our time is coming to an end here. So final question. What prompted you to get into public service? And uh, can Nevada voters expect to see Zach Koenig's uh, name on a uh, ballot again? Well, yes, I'm running for re-election uh, and we're going to win. And we're going to win because we are focused on the work, right? It's not, the Treasury is not a flashy office. The Treasury is not about uh, getting your name in the paper. The Treasury is about getting up every day and trying to make the state a little bit better because that's what investing is, right? It's incremental gain. You're not shooting the moon. What you're trying to do is get a little bit better each and every day. When I first got in office, the reason why I ran was because I've got kids. I've got a seven-year-old, Ruby, got two three-year-olds, uh, Teddy and Ford, they're going to turn four next week, uh, and we'll embark upon the, the four-year-old twin boy adventure. Um, but I want them to have a better state to live in than I've been blessed with. You know, I grew up in a small town in upstate New York. My grandfather was a butcher. My mom's a school teacher. And they, they grounded out every day to make sure that I could go to the hospitality school at Cornell to make sure that I had the options and the resources available to me. And that's what I want to give my kids. And that's what I want to give kids that I'm never going to meet. Nevada is about generational growth, right? That our kids have a better chance than we had it, that their kids have a better chance than they had it. And in a lot of ways, the work that we've been doing in the treasury helps to make that better. Keeping people in their homes allows for generational growth. Keeping small businesses alive allows for generational growth. Finally fixing federal funding so that we can get the resources we deserve allows for general growth. And the Every Nevada Recovery Framework that massive, massive undertaking uh, that we're right at the center of, along with the governor and legislative leadership, is about making sure that this one-time infusion of capital from the federal government gets used to create generational growth. And so you ask why, you know, why come from the private sector, uh, which is deeply more lucrative than the public sector, in order to do this work? Because it matters. Because somebody has to do it. And I think we're pretty good at it. Nevada State Treasurer Zach Conine, thank you so much for your time this morning, and um, we'll see you down the road. Thanks so much.